Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk USA with me, Al Murray, James Holland and John McManus. Um, how are we, chaps? Yeah, they're no, all good. All good. Um, and, and excited about your book. Alan. Oh, well, thank Congrats you. on the book. And uh, John, you've you've just read it, haven't you? So um, Absolutely. Come on. What do you yes, think? Yes, I sent, I sent you a PDF because it's not out in America yet. So uh, hopefully... Uh, it'll hit some American, sunny day. <laughs> some American airport somewhere. We'll have it, copies of it. Um, uh, but, no but, doubt the it book, will. But the book's called Command How the Allies Learned to Win the Second World War. And what I tried what I tried to do is use 10 sort of essays about people at different stages of the war, some of them very well known and some of them obscure, to try and chart from shock defeat to, in my view, crushing victory by the end of the war and what lessons had to be digested and what realities had to be faced. But, but also, and, and 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 the impact they have on those ultimate victories, and, yes. and I think one of the things that's really interesting is what you're not doing. You're not giving a potted history of their entire career and kind of you know this is what they did and they went to West Point and they did this and they did that. You're, you're focusing on one or two aspects, yeah, and how that influences their gestation of command yeah. and and, that, yeah. and their their maturity of command and the part that that plays in the ultimate yeah. victory. And where that sits on the, the Allied path, because uh, yes, uh, exactly. what it shows. Yes, exactly. So, so inevitably, I wrote, I wrote about, about George Patton. Um, I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about the Second World War is it's as much a, a historiographical event as a historical one. The, 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 the sheer, I mean, you only have to look at what Russian historiography of the Second World War obviously is and how, how people are acting on what they think happened the legends that spring up. And, and George Patton is sort of paradigmatic right. of that. He exists off reservation, outside the academic world, outside the even the military art history world. He's an entity that exists beyond the control of any any historian, I think, is the, is the, is the really interesting thing about him. He's and a powerful symbol. He's everything. And I think you tapped he? into that. Because he's, you know, an American man of war, isn't he? And saw himself as that. He absolutely is. And indulged in that idea and promulgated it and spread it. I mean, I find him, I mean, I actually find him, having written about him, I, I, I find him sort of irresistible in a way I never did before. I've been, oh God, do we have to do Patton and Montgomery compared? Well, do you remember, do you remember when we were looking at those diary entries and you could see all that self-doubt and the kind of, I, you know, I, I feel really ill with nerves the day before, you know, an attack yeah. is launched and all this kind of stuff. Well, hang on a minute, you know, this is this the same Patton who's kind of all old blood and guts and all the rest of it? I yeah. mean, you you can see his frailties and his his personal frailties and doubts in his writings, which I think is just fascinating. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, well, you know, to give you a sense of how he how he sits in terms of being this powerful symbol. Um, there are commercials in the U.S. called The General, and it, and it features this sort of cartoon, uh, like like four or five star general that sort of vaguely resembles Patton and and sort of has his mannerisms and and they're selling car insurance, you know. Um, <laughs> another little anecdote I'll give you. The other day in uh, in my U.S. history class, I was talking about MacArthur and MacArthur's early campaigns in the Philippines and all this kind of stuff. And one of my students raised her hand and said, so is this the general who who had slapping incidents? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. no, actually, that, that was George Patton. But there again, this is the only thing she knew so far about any American general World War II, and it was Patton with the slapping incidents. My I mean, God. Isn't that amazing? That is incredible. Our movies, that's, eh? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. But even when the movie's made is interesting. It's because it's during, it's the height of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and And so what you need is a, a good film about American martial values, to to reassure people that actually things are fine, the American army knows what it's doing, um, and that and the you know the the Germans are re reassuringly defeatable in in the in the Patton film. Right, there can be this triumphant narrative. Yeah, I know. I never understood why George Scott turned down his Oscar. If he's going to turn down his Oscar, why take the part in the first place? Yeah, I've always wondered the same thing. It's odd, right. but you it's know, yeah. It's, yeah it's, we read the script. I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> the movie comes out in 1970, which is like, you know, the, the height of the, the protests of the Vietnam War. And it isn't just some idle thing. I mean, certainly it's lauded, but it affects Richard Nixon. President Nixon loves the movie and he's watching the movie, you know, as a way to buck himself up for the Cambodian incursion in 1970. Um, and I think that that that's a microcosm for Patton's larger kind of powerful cultural presence for us that, that Al, again, I think you really tapped into, uh, you know, it, cause yeah, you couldn't cover his whole career all that. I mean, people have written, yeah. you know, libraries about the guy, whatever, but 
but to to give us some new insights um, and how you saw him and and that image of how you see it circling to to understand him better at the operational level too as a general, I thought was really interesting. Well, thank you. Well, I, I've got to say that was one of my takeaways when I first read it, and I, I, you know, it's really got me thinking about Patton as an operational commander. You, you know, because everyone always talks about his his tactical prowess, but actually, what you see is that sort of you know extreme training, preparation, dotting the i's, crossing the t's, not taking anything to chance. You know, and once you've built yourself up, and once you've done, then you go for it. But, you know, he's he's in in some ways he's no less cautious than montgomery he just wraps it up in a different package yeah and he's prepared his whole life for this i mean he, yeah. you know <laughs> and the way that's the really interesting thing about him isn't it is that it is this is the thing he wants more than anything else i mean we, we're, and we've we've talked about macarthur before who's from a proud military family but he's that much older than uh Patton, so he's been around longer Patton stre- wants to be a soldier from when he's a boy, he reads military history. He overcomes his dyslexia to, to as far as we know, that's what it is, to, to mm-hmm. steep himself in the idea that he's going to become a sort of American Hannibal. And yes, he's it, incredibly well read, isn't he? He's incredibly well read. And by the time the First World War comes along, he is he is devising new sabre technique. He is he's your, he is actually making a difference. It's not in his head, is it? It's his it's his ability and it's his it's his drive and his his actual talent for the thing he wants to do. Well, that's the way he prepares, I think, is, is, you know, particularly interesting to us and relatable Mm -hmm. because he's immersed in military history. I mean, that's what he's doing and studying and preparing that way. Uh, And I think it pays off. Yeah. Pays off in in all of the study of ancient history, ancient military history, but also tangible study of the ground at Normandy, you know, during his honeymoon. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you're on your honeymoon. And uh, your your big agenda is to study the ground <laughs> wherever you're wherever you are. How your new wife would feel about that? Um, He's obsessed, <laughs> isn't he? He is <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> he is. He and, really, and, really is. Uh, the, so there isn't a lot else for this guy. I mean, th- and so when World War II comes along, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, absolutely, this is his sort of moment. Um, and 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 so he's had decades of preparing himself. Whereas I think there's a tendency, you know, since World War II to think in terms of preparing yourself for battle physically, um, you know, a mania for physical fitness, say, in the U.S. Army, which is great. But also, I think the military history side of it sometimes is overlooked. Uh, And I think Westmoreland was a prime example of that in Vietnam, that he was he he's sort of the anti Patton in terms of not quite understanding what had happened to the French and all these kinds of things that, that would probably have never have happened to Patton. Uh, and I, so I, I think that in, in the chapter you have on Patton now, it, you conveyed that sense of his personality and, yeah. and where that fit with, with how he operated as a commander on the ground. Yeah. And he's also canny enough to have a media presentation version of himself as well. You know, he loves briefing journalists. He loves, he loves giving them off record stuff. He's and he's always trying to con- control what they, you know, don't print that. You can't print that. He's always got that really ambivalent relationship with the press that people very often who are trying to control their image have. He loves them as much as he hates them because he's feeding he's feeding the PR beast the whole time with anecdotes you could, you know, and pithy one-liners and all that, which he's really, I mean, he's really good at that too. I mean, it- yeah, and his, his speeches, he's, well, I mean, when he first arrives in, in Normandy and does that inverted commas off the cuff kind of talk to the reporters, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And, you know, they've just been sat through this kind of, this campaign, which on the map anyway is not, doesn't look like it's really moving. And what it needs is a massive sort of kick up its ass. And, and suddenly his pattern going, I'm going to, you know, I'm, gonna tear into these bastards and, and all this kind of stuff i mean it's just you can, you can see why everyone loves it i mean he's, he's the ultimate showman isn't he i mean it's, it's amazing and it's also incredible i think how for someone who who professes to be such a christian so god-fearing and and take religion so seriously is also sort of constantly exhorting people to kill others yeah, I mean, the famous thing about uh, having his chaplain a, a prayer to get uh, better weather during the Battle of Bulge and the chaplain. And there, there is truth to this. It's in the movie, but there's truth to it, too. The chaplain saying, well, a prayer so we can kill our fellow man. But to, to Patton, you know, this isn't about religion at that point. This is the job of soldiering is killing. Uh, he's, he's an awful human being on some levels, too. His anti-Semitism 
just his his uh, his uh, dismissiveness in terms of race and and uh, so he, when you get deeper into the layers of Patton, there's some really unappealing sides to him, and yet you have the sensitive side too, where he, where he almost cries at the drop of a hat sometimes too, and is sensitive to to what's actually happening at the front. Yeah, yes, I mean he and he talks about how he has to sort of compose himself and psych himself up. For, for some of it, which is, which he confides that in his diary, which I think is really interesting. The idea that he know, you know, he he knows some of it's an act, and he's and he's he's got to sort of put it put it on, which which I think maybe is reflected in uh, how he uses, co- you know, uniform uh, uh, to to project an image of himself. He's putting on the armor of the of the pat- soldier pattern. I mean, we're psychoanalyzing him now, but that he's putting on the garb of this idea of of a general that he's got that or that he thinks his men need to see or need to need to um need need to have present and and you know and, and inevitably that's not unlike an awful lot of people have twigged this is what you need to do in the in the second world war is project an image of yourself and offer a figurehead for your men to have confidence in and all that sort of stuff and he's 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 really good at that but he also feels he's putting on the armor to be the general yeah John Keegan called it the mask of command. I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly it. it. Yeah, yeah. Patton's yeah, a master yeah. at that, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I've always had the sense too, and I would have loved to, have, you know, to, to have been there on the receiving end of one of his talks. I always had the sense, you know, in certainly in reading the speeches or whatever, that he's almost like playing up to it, like playing up to the crowd and <laughs> cultivating this persona somehow, and and the cursing, absolutely. Certainly. Absolutely. I mean, the, the the way that speech reads, you know, as someone who, you know, I, I speak a lot to big audiences and you need to push their buttons and you need to play on the impression they have of you. You need to give them what they're what they think they've come to hear. And you, you also but you also need to surprise them a little and you need to tie it up at the end with something pithy. It's I mean, it's 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 so he does all of that, doesn't he? He's a comic genius. <laughs> well, well, I mean, a lot and a lot of it is really funny is the other thing I think is. That, um, <laughs> You know, know, which is which is the, which is I think sometimes you know you read it they go oh it's blood curdling and it's ghastly and what a terrible man and why would anyone talk like this and surely this can't be the way of getting the soldiers going but a lot it's 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 knowing and it's comic a lot of it in its presentation which I think is really really interesting you know that whole story that, that they're more frightened of the of, of me than they are the enemy and all that sort of thing you think oh you old ham it's sort of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You're an old man. Yeah. <laughs> Why exactly. are they so frightened of you? You know. Yeah. 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 So the dual was that one of the things that drew you to him the, to 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 discuss him that the comic side, like the well, no, the, just the when you've got a ch- someone offering a speech like that, what's the what's its function? What's its purpose? And when he's doing it, is really interesting because after all, what's really interesting about the, the slapping incident is he. Yeah, he loses his job, but they hire him again pretty quickly. You know, it's not he's not out of the loop for any time at all. And in fact, that's the job he was always going to get when it comes to Northwest Europe, isn't he? You know, there's no way Bradley isn't going to command the initial landing force, and there's no way Patton isn't going to command the the follow up. It's it's just doesn't make any sense to think of it any other way. And that then he kicks himself, and says, "Well, Bradley got this job long before I did, and I was never going to get the job." Well, no, you weren't. You know, that was never going to tumble that way. Because you're not temperamentally suited to the to the landing bit, I think is my, my my view. But I think it's really interesting that you know he's fired for all of five minutes. The scandal blows over because they know they need they know they need him. They know that he's too good to have on the bench. Yeah, yeah. They didn't have the luxury of just consigning him to the bench any longer. And yeah. the other thing too is like it, it's kind of an interesting study in how full circle the army had come on corporal punishment. Um, if this is a hundred some odd years before, that's standard stuff to be slapping yeah. soldiers. That was yeah. you would sentence a, a guy and he would be sentenced to seven slaps or whatever. I mean, Zachary Taylor himself, who eventually became president of the United States, you know, was a soldier and he had slapped soldiers and all that kind of stuff. So a right. hundred years later, now this is really unacceptable. If we're talking yeah. about a a, a drill instructor at Marine boot camp. Well then, yeah, have at it. You know, you do whatever you do, but for a senior level person by then in the American mind, that is just simply unacceptable. Uh, and yeah. so that's why you have so many people just fired up about this is saying, what are we fighting for? If we're going to allow our generals to be beating on our soldiers who after all is a citizen army, 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so it's like, wait a minute, that could be my son. But then, like you said, Al, he's just simply too valuable. And I think enough Americans are willing to sort of look the other way <laughs> once it comes down to it. And for, and for yeah. good reason, I think. Yeah. I mean, I suppose he knows he knows all about Zachary Taylor slapping soldiers and he probably thinks he's part of a he's part of that tradition, isn't he? It's just, I haven't done anything wrong, nor did he. You know, it's, it's, it's right. It's, it's something what you do. Well, and you know, the other thing that's always amazed me, the two guys he slapped seem to have no real hard feelings against him for the rest of their lives, because believe me, they were heavily interviewed, you know, later <laughs> on, especially when the movie came out in 1970. Yeah. I think they were both still alive. They seem to have no real hard feelings. And you put yourself in that circumstance. I don't know that I would be as magnanimous. I don't know. Would you guys? What do you think? Well, I don't know. Maybe Patton's too big a figure to criticize, I guess. Maybe. (sighs) Yeah. What do you think, Jim? How would you feel if, you know, this guy comes and slaps you? It's like. Well, particularly because as one of them, it turns out he had malaria and was kind of, you know, he was genuinely really ill. Um, (laughs) Exactly. It's the most extraordinary. (laughs) It's an extraordinary episode because when he goes in and, and sees that, He's enraged. He's fine one minute, and then do you know what? This just absolutely gets my go, and I'm gonna go mental on this guy because I'm just I'm so cross. I mean, it is he is uncontrolled, isn't he? I mean, it is an uncontrolled, instant rage response to something which he thinks is utterly disgusting and disgusting. Yeah, it's zero to sixty that someone is shirking in a in a in a hospital cot when he could be out. Fighting when there's people next to him who've lost limbs or bad bullets in their shoulders or whatever. That's a wound. It's such an astonishing response. And what I find is just so amazing is, is is that how that that kind of sort of new modern way of looking at, 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 at battle casualties hasn't caught up with with Patton, but it has with a whole host of other senior commanders. You know, whether mm. it be Alexander, whether it be Eisenhower. I mean, they they absolutely get it that that's. That's not acceptable behavior. Well, and also, but you also you don't do it when there are journalists about. I think it's part of no, the but other, that's the point. It's, it's part, of the, other but, but part of the crime. <laughs> part of the crime is the uncontrolled nature of it. It's, it's the fact that he 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 doesn't have a check. He doesn't he doesn't have a part of him going. Oh, hang on a minute. This is not appropriate time. He's just so incensed that he's out of control. And do you want army commanders to be people who 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 lose it to such an extent that they're out of control? So it's it's not just that he's slapping them. There's something more kind of primeval about it, which is deeply disturbing. I think. Yeah, I mean, and when you that's got... what shocks that's what shocks Eisenhower as much as the actual slapping. It's the fact that he hasn't controlled himself not to do the slap, whatever he might, whatever thoughts he might harbor privately. The fact that there's journalists there, the fact that he's in a hospital, you know, there's no constraint. Yeah, tens of thousands of lives on the line that, you know, you control as an army commander. Right. Millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment, weaponry, property, you know, all of that. Yeah, you don't want somebody who's just <laughs> going to lose it. Flip and uh, go yeah, ape and, shit. I mean, yeah, yeah absolutely. Something. Well, and, you know, the other thing, too, is I think one of the reasons he does this, and and it, this, this is another thing that really struck me as, as I read Al's uh, analysis of him, Patton's concepts of masculinity and maleness and what it was to be a man. And that was really wrapped up in the idea that you do your part on the front line fighting, that that's what men do. And that's what American yes. men do in particular. And so I think I've always thought, you know, the slapping incidents in a way are, you know, his sort of view of masculinity, just like, oh my God, this is just unthinkable for a man to behave this way. Um, and so you see it constantly in his speeches men are this men do this men do that it's it's um well it's a and it's a sort of unvarnished idea of masculinity that you would you would you know that i don't know whether you'd be able to express it like that now you know and then obviously you wouldn't di- to different no, different times different values and all that sort of stuff but he he is very very focused on the question of masculinity and a military service of masculinity and uh uh, and also that idea that Americans Americans like fighting and they like winners <laughs> and, and all this sort of stuff. But also it's it's tapping into that kind of sense that you know, you get it a lot in, in other Hollywood movies about the West, don't you? And and Westerns and stuff yeah. about, you know, a, a real you know, he's a real man and 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 there's that yep. there's that line that Clint Eastwood does, doesn't he, in Unforgiven, where he goes, It's quite a thing killing a man. You take away all he's got, all he's ever gonna have. And it's this kind of, it's this. It's like he was in the room, Jim. 
Oh, well, <laughs> there you good. are. <laughs> and, and, but, it, but it's this, this sense, isn't it, that, 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 you know, being a man is confronting violence and danger and taking it on the chin and standing up to it. And if you don't stand up to it, you die. And that's just the way the cookie crumbles. But being a part of being an American man is to face that danger head on. And, and you don't wimp out just because you're kind of feeling a little bit tired or you don't be a bit, a bit scared. That's, that's the pattern view, isn't it? That is definitely and, and, it and it's view. tied up with that kind of psyche of the kind of the frontier and being tough and being manly and chopping wood and Gary and, Cooper and indi- in a Western. Yeah, and individualistic. Right. Sort of, it's the individualistic frontier American, right. all that sort of stuff. Although that's a, a, a complete contrast with his idea of operational uh, integration and the fact that everyone's relying on each Which other. Which is incredibly sophisticated. And Which is incredibly sophisticated. So he's talking in this sort of individualistic language, but it's actually he's talking about everyone. Everyone has to rely on each other and you're all part of a team and you know, you're know you all as important to each other as each other, actually. Which is really an interesting contrast. And what, what's fun, interesting about the great speech is he's able to elide the two and not, not, uh, not lay bare the contradiction. Because he's because he's a clever enough speaker. Yep. Well. Yep. Absolutely. We should take a break, shouldn't we? And then we should take a break. Yeah, we'll come back. And maybe we'll talk about Omar Bradley. Yeah, why not? Um, we'll see you in a second. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk USA with me, Al Murray, James Holland, and John McManus, and we've. Well, we've t- that's Patton dealt with. I uh, don't think there needs to be any more uh, breath or ink spent on <laughs> George S. Patton. We've recovered him there quite <laughs> well. I'd say one last thing on Patton. I think it's really on, interesting. Boy, well, I think that that time waste charge of US two corps down in southern Tunisia um, in March nineteen forty three. I think is a is a really really important time. He has this big spat with with um, uh, Air Vice Marshal Mary Cunningham about control of you know how you use air power. Uh, and he loses that particular fight. And although Cunningham goes and talks to him, he doesn't admit he's wrong, but he changes his way when it comes to how you deal with air power. And he absorbs that lesson very quickly. The really interesting thing about about, about Sicily and chomping at the bit and wanting to, to spring off to the west and get, get Palermo and clear the western part of the island is not what it teaches him in terms of combat and tactical military experience. It's what it teaches him in terms of, of logistics and that, again, that operational art. And it's such a useful lesson because what it teaches him is how to harness your forces in big strides and be effective and maneuver and move um, combined forces, you know, artillery, anti aircraft artillery, infantry, armor together over big swathes of land in a very, very effective and decisive way. And he does it brilliantly. And again, it's that big, big lesson. And what this is, the setback happens with the snapping, but by the time he gets to be commanding Third Army in preparation for um, moving overseas into Normandy in the beginning of August 1944, he's kind of the complete package. He's, he, and, and again, he's like a sort of leitmotif for the whole US Army in that sense of growth, that sense of kind of, okay, we're a bit rough around the edges in 1942. We've still got quite a lot to learn. But boy, once we go into combat, we're going to learn, learn really quickly. And he's one of those key people that that just sucks up the lessons and spews them back out again in a kind of much more complete form. So that, as I say, by the time he gets into Normandy and he's he's sort of unleashed, you know, right, press the go button, off you go, George. He's absolutely nailed it. You know, he he just understands how air power works in cahoots with, with land operations. He kind of understands how you 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 coordinate um, the various arms of your army together to, to 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 take big strides. He understands when you can put on the throttle, when you need to rein it back in, when you need to train, when you need to be kind of properly prepared. You know, he's he's such a sort of complete general. And I think the greatest generals in the Second World War are those ones that understand the three levels of war, understand what your strategic concept is, understand operationally your constraints and what you've got to do and how you can get the best out of your operational system and structure, your logistics base, but also have tactical flair. And, and, and not everyone's got them. You know, I would say that Rommel is a very good tactical commander, but is kind of slow on, you know, not so good operationally and not so good strategically. But Patton, I, I think, has all three. Yeah, most definitely. And, he, you know, his, his shining moment is definitely August 1944. And I think in particular, his grasp of close air support 
um, air power. It's just at a completely different level then versus North Africa almost two years earlier. Well, it's only it's not even two years. It's only it's only eighteen months. Isn't right, it? it's eighteen. And months, that's not a lot of time. And and, and some, a lot of that time is not in action. So, right. Yeah, yeah, it is amazing. Anyway, um, anyway, that's enough, George Patton. I mean, yeah. said many people, I'm sure. Um, uh, uh, Omar Bradley is the uh, uh, the other American uh, commander I, I wrote about, and I I find him sort of um, you know fascinating the reciprocal to to George in the reciprocal bearing to George Patton, because he's a sort of study, a self-study in ordinariness, I think. And, and, uh, that this, I, you know, that he comes, ends up with the subriquet, the GI general. And I think he's, he's very interesting as a sort of different, if Amer- if Patton's the individualistic American expression, Bradley's far more the, you know, this is speaking as a, as, as a Brit, as a sort of trying to divine American culture from afar He's the sort of ordinary, the humble, ordinary American, the sort of regular guy rather than the rugged individualist who's part of a team and all that sort of stuff. And and I know he's styling himself as that as well, because he also he can't have got to where he did by not having a high opinion of himself. And he does have a quietly burning high opinion of himself. He's such a fascinating opposite in a way, although they share lots of qualities. But yeah, well, they're they're frenemies. Basically, yeah. they're frenemies. I mean, that's the yeah. term we would use nowadays, and and, yeah. and they are. But we were we were we've been discussing a lot about image, um, mm-hmm. commander's image. Yeah. Well, Bradley's image, his persona is that ordinary, unassuming GI general. Behind that veneer, though, is a guy who is very ambitious. Uh, of yeah. course, extraordinarily competent on a lot of levels. Was a great athlete, just like Patton was, by the way, yeah. and really is a is a backbiter of the first order that that <laughs> ma- <laughs> that that many would be like wait a minute Bradley was like that he, he was uh, so he he was a master at making you think he wasn't trying to cultivate an image just an unassuming guy on the margins happy to do his thing and there's some truth to that but really he was also pushing that image of himself so it was like it was image gold to have Ernie Pyle of all people Ernie Pyle write about him and describe him that way, the exact way. Imagine if, if you had a journalist, a very prominent journalist, describe you in the exact way you would want to be described for your own public image. That's yeah, yeah, what yeah, happened yeah. with Bradley. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, and, and he's, I mean, it's because so, Pyle, Pyle, when he writes about him, says, when I first encountered him, I don't know what to write because he's kind of boring. I can't describe him as handsome because he isn't. I can't describe him as this. And, and and, you know, then, as you say, goes on to portray Bradley in exactly the sort of terms he would like to be depicted. And I think what, what, what what's really interesting is obviously Bradley's convinced this is the sort of way to go. Um, if you are surrounded by people like George S. Patton, if you've got you can't compete with that. There's absolutely no way you can you can you can match Patton's sort of uh, flamboyance. So what you do is you you, you inspire confidence by being by playing things down, by wearing the same uniform as the not only your guys but as your boss, because that's the other thing. Is he's very much a sort of George Marshall mini me, isn't he? It, 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 but also, like, there's nothing kind of spick and span about him, and kind of, sort no. of polish and brass and old school. And I, I remember this is uh, on the front cover of Life magazine. I think it was it's like the middle of August 1944. There's a picture of a GI, and. It's it's the picture that literally every Hollywood film has kind of taken to their heart ever since. So it's a it's a really good looking guy, square jawed. He's got his helmet on slightly at an angle. He's got a three day growth of beard. Um, um, he's got his um his straps from his helmet hanging loose. When when one is thinking of the classic American GI from World War Two in the European theater. He's your man. And Bradley is the commander of that man, you know, and he is the commander of those armies. And I think you make the very interesting point that he, you know, he, he commands more troops than any general in American history, the four armies, 12 corps, 48 divisions. I mean, it's a, it's a vast amount of, of manpower that is under his command. And what he's trying to do, and, and you see this a lot in, the, of, in the, the approach of the Americans in the Second World, where, whether it be the kind of, you know, the, the, the Parsons jacket based on a pre-war civilian wind cheater, you know, and its look. This is about ordinary guys answering the call, doing their bit for Uncle Sam, 
you know, so that they can get home for the folks back in kind of, you know, Oklahoma or whatever. And, and, and Bradley just symbolizes all of that psyche, doesn't he? And taps I mean, into it. That's how it. I read it. <clears throat> and taps into it big time. And taps and into it. And, and, it. and it's just, you know, he's just an yeah. ordinary guy. He's just doing his bit too. It just happens that he's the kind of the most, most powerful kind of troop commander in theater, you know, outside of Eisenhower. But, but it's, it's, it's part of an image. So, you know, we're all in it together. You know, I, I'm just like you. You know, I could be your father. I could be mm-hmm. your uncle. And has that look. The spectacles certainly help. The image was everything. I, th- I think, Jim, I think the guy you were describing was Lieutenant Kelso Horn, uh, a paratrooper with the rifle, too, and a sort of, you know, it's a sort of close up shot. And he's in yeah, Normandy. Yeah, he was on the if front a... cover of Life magazine yeah. in August, like August the 17th or something. And he's not a he's not a snaggle toothed Tommy either. Um, <laughs> you know, no, he's... he most certainly isn't. You know, <laughs> no, he's he going to be ripped. You know, his team. Well, he looks the paratrooper tough. part, and and uh, yeah. but he's actually a little old. I think he was in his late twenties, which would be old. But, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. But, well, how do you think Bradley formulated this? Because um, I think you know the, the the really big thing in his development as a sort of citizen soldier commander is his time with the CCC. That's the the point where the army is essentially forced to face the American population and the, and the, the, the state <laughs> of the American population in the Great Depression. And rather than the bonus marches, which is, of course, where the army forces its, itself to face um, uh, 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 ordinary Americans who've been in the... Uh, does it at bayonet point with cavalry charges I mean, completely. I mean, that episode in it alone, that it doesn't shatter the relationship between the state and the American population doesn't destroy it i think it's quite extraordinary really that you still you're able to get people to join the army after that it's quite remarkable really i mean that's a question i've, I've been uh, I, I couldn't figure out the answer how does america repair its relationship between the, its population and its army after the bonus marches because that's the it's a sort of insurmountable problem i'd argue well it's uh in a way it's blamed on certain individuals uh, like right. president hoover <laughs> really kind of unfairly <laughs> okay. douglas macarthur perhaps more fairly, um, <laughs> that it wasn't necessarily an army thing so much as a leadership thing. But the, the American public always have this sort of love-hate relationship with their professional military forces uh, in the 20s and 30s. I didn't like them that much. Once uh, the wolf came at the door in World War II, now all of a sudden they loved it. And now all of a sudden, you know, the army is going to have 11 million people and that takes you into society, you know. So, um, I, you know, Al, I thought, I, I, I don't know that I've ever seen such a uh, an in-depth and insightful look at Bradley's time with the CCC, which I really think is overlooked um, in terms of his understanding of how to to work with citizen soldiers, ultimately, uh, and to understand a lot about the American everyman and to, to plan out the logistics and all that. You know, so Bradley, Bradley's really interesting on a lot of levels because he represents a kind of a, you know, to him, the army is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for upward social mobility uh, that existed at that time and place if if you were white, if you were a white guy. Uh, it didn't matter if you were poor or didn't have advantages. The army offered that opportunity. And Bradley had already done that by the 1930s. So you see him reach, I think, through CCC, really more than I had appreciated before reading your chapter, uh, a um, a level of kind of maturity in understanding the kind of citizen soldiers he's likely to deal with and understanding some of the logistics of standing up an army yeah because a lot, lot of the a lot of the problems they face um uh you know when when conscription does come in a sort of xeroxes of what what's been going on that you know people arrive they're underfed they're not fit you know the effects of the great depression on on people he has to deal with that all over again when the war comes and so he knows what to do exactly. and 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 the sort of army's army's muscle memory has been very much developed during the during the time of the CCC. I mean, I I find that period absolutely fascinating because whenever you hear anyone argue about national service in this country, bring back national service because it would sort young people out. Well, the army isn't a branch of the social services. That's not its job. Its job its jobs to be prepared to to war fight. Use that horrible expression. Where you know wherever it's sent, not to like make sure that kids learn how to make their beds and use cutlery or whatever or whatever it is. <laughs> Or whatever it is that that they're right. supposed to be was supposed to be the benefit of this, and yet here's the American Army actually basically doing that, being brought in to process people, give them something to do, give them a purpose in life, 
and kind of well, it's like a democratic version of of the kind of um, our um, our bite deeds, isn't well, it? Well, that's the, the, uh, and that's the criticism, isn't it? That's the the criticism that comes from the left is that it's our bite deeds. Um, uh, yeah, it's right. just the same. You know? Yep. Uh, yes, but it's but but it's probably not because you're not well, having all that isn't. political <laughs> doctrination and all the yeah. you know all the marching and the kind of saluting and you know adoration of a of an autocrat. So I mean, I think the other thing is, I mean, we've had a lot of a lot of talk about kind of politicians and, and being empathetic or not being empathetic recently. And and I was having um, when I was in in the US a couple of weeks ago, John, I was talking with um, with Tammy Davis Bill and and with Mike Nyberg, and we we're saying, you know, we were talking about various politicians in in the US at the moment and whether they whether they were empathetic whether they had that empathy and you know if you you can apply that to, it, it would seem a sort of strange concept I, I suppose back in the 1940s but 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 actually that's one of the things that, that Bradley does have doesn't he he has he has terrific empathy with the troops and, and that's not something that's that's put on for show that is that is genuine you you can see that i mean it's fascinating when you read Chet Hansen's diary which is obviously in the um, in the U.S. Army um, Heritage and Education Center, you can read the whole thing, and he and he keeps it from from Tunisia all the way through to the end of the war. And he's basically, and he ends up writing what ghost writing doesn't he? One of Bradley's, uh, one of the two autobiographies, exactly. And Clay Blair did the other but, one. But, but the point is, they're very close. They have a good relationship. He, you know, Chet Hansen's a bright, smart guy, writes very well, but he writes in the moment, and that's one of the things that I think is is so so interesting about that diary. So you 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 get this. You're you're getting an image of 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 Bradley, which I mean, the interesting thing is that because that diary has never been published. So you, the other, the thing with diaries, and particularly when it comes to senior leaders, you're always sort of thinking, well, are they writing this with a nod to kind of publishing post war? You know, whether Hanson is is thinking that or not, I'm not sure. But but it feels very in the moment the, the diary, and and the, some of the little insights you get into Bradley, I think, are really really fascinating, and he does come across as all those things you were saying, you know, the, the ambition is absolutely there. The irritation he gets, he gets irritated and annoyed by quite a lot of things. But he's he's a diplomat, I would say. I, I think he's very good at kind of knowing when to kind of, you know, he might gripe and gripe, you know, gripe and complain, but but he knows when to kind of be polite and courteous and remembers, you know, that these are all allies together and all this kind of stuff. And you also sense that when when he is talking to soldiers, he's very happy and and the weight of responsibility he feels it very keenly uh, and and you you get that he understands that this is a civilian army which goes back to your your whole point and the whole thesis of your your chapter out but 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 i think that's very genuine i think he was i think he comes across as a very kind of real person but someone who absolutely is empathetic with the men no, that he definitely he is, has that empathy. he is in charge of and that makes him come across yeah. as a much more attractive character than a lot of the other commanders Despite the backbiting, despite the waspishness, despite the kind of moments of irritation, and, and, it's interesting and the kind of because naked ambition. he's he is empathetic. He's he commands massive combat forces, but he's really not a combat soldier. In spite of the fact that he has an infantry background, what he is, he's a war manager, and and really he's the most successful American war manager on on at least that operational level that we could maybe ever point to. And he, he kind of influences the next generation that comes along and wants to war manage the Vietnam War. And that just isn't going to work the same way. Um, so Bradley is about management. Um, and yet he also has that image, which is part of the management. But he's not a flash and dash combat soldier the way Patton might think of himself. Yeah, he's come up from the shop floor like everyone else. Isn't There's it? that quote you've got about the um, about when he does the talk uh, in 1971. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, where's that? Yeah, I'm just Jeff trying to find Bradley it. He says we're all going to be all right. I mean, the thing is that speech, obviously, he's making that during the Vietnam War, so it's full of sort of other messages. But it's that um, you know, uh, just before the invasion of Normandy in '44, a story went around in some of the amphibious assault units that went ashore that they would suffer 100% casualties, that none of them would come back. This is Bradley makes a speech at, um, uh, at the US Army College. Um, I found it necessary to visit these units, units and talk to all ranks. I told them that we would naturally suffer casualties, but that our losses would for certain be manageable and that with our air and naval support, we would succeed. After our landing, a correspondent t told me that on his way across the channel in one of the leading LSTs, he'd noticed a sergeant reading a novel. Struck by the seeming lack of concern of the sergeant, he asked, aren't you worried? How can you be reading at a time like this? 
The sergeant replied, no, I'm not worried. General Bradley said everything would go all right. So why should I worry? <laughs> and I've Nothing. always thought that in such a cynical combat soldier way, I've always wondered, okay, was he being sardonic or was he really saying? Well, we'll, we'll never know, but obviously Bradley well, comes no, out. That is a great quote, but that's not the quote I was thinking about. I was oh, thinking right, but, about... No, but Bradley, but also Bradley comes out terribly well out of that anecdote. He does, about yes, yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> but the quote I was going to say was, while it takes a good staff officer to initiate an effective oh, yeah. plan, it requires a leader to ensure that the plan is properly executed. And that, yeah. that is basically what you've just been saying, John, about, about the war manager, war managing. Yep, and he manages the personnel as much as anything. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, he's also. I mean, what what's very interesting though is when he gets to North Africa, you get into that whole thing where, when he's asked to when in Tunisia, where he's asked to sort of be Ike's eyes and eyes and ears, and figure out figure out where they've been going wrong. That whole thing he gets into about the Louisiana maneuvers is very, very interesting. That he says, he says, we fooled ourselves with these maneuvers because the umpires would tell people, oh, this is the point at which you surrender, so you should surrender, and that. <laughs> What what what's going on on the ground in a unit is quite different to what happens in an. He says we've learned all we need to learn operationally about how to make this work, but we've learned we haven't figured out those small moments, men, leadership, what will happen, you know, when there aren't umpires, when actually some major decides no, we aren't giving up this hill now when we when we would have done in an exercise, and he says that's the that's the bit that's missing from what the American army has learned in Louisiana, which I think is incredibly interesting that because he's not, like you say, he's not a combat general. He hasn't done that. He's turned up and he's sifting the information he's getting, getting the reports from, from everyone he's spoken to. He's looking at the circumstances and he's drawing that conclusion, which I think is absolutely fascinating because he's no experience of this. He doesn't know this for himself. He's able to talk to people and, as you say, manage them to figure out what he needs to do management wise to get them to do what he needs them to do. And I think that's, yeah. that's very interesting because, you know, Patton at least has combat experience. He's seen the limits of training, uh, which yeah. at the Louisiana maneuvers he has and basically creating two divisions, the 82nd and the 28th, yeah. Uh, yeah. which he was heavily involved in that. Yeah. So now he's, he's saying his two core, mm -mm. Um, this yeah. is only going to go so far. And I, yeah. I do, I think he advances the understanding very well. Yeah. I mean, that's a fascinating moment because after all, Patton, for instance, has combat experience, but Bradley has none and yet is able to, you know, is, is an important part in that transition in, you know, the American tactical understanding and, 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 and operational understanding where he says, well, hold on a minute. We've only learned, we, you know, we've only learned that so much from what we've done before. And uh, th that he has that kind of insight, I think is really interesting. I've got to say, I really, I really warm to Bradley. I, I, you know, I've written about him quite a lot over the years and got to know him a bit. And I just think he comes across as a very, very attractive character. And I like the fact that he's got a few flaws that he backbites and he's got a bit of, you know, I mean, you want your generals to be ambitious, I think. And, but I think it, I think the thing that really warms me to him is, is that sound competence. And I, and, you know, there's so much criticism, isn't there, over the, over the last sort of 50 years about, you know, Germans had tactical flair, but all the Allied generals were just sort of, you know, they just sort of ground their way forward using kind of, you know, their superior material to kind of get their get their goals. And I just don't see it that way at all. I, th I, I think either. I think the way he handles his forces, that empathy, that kind of management, this huge sort of beast of a machine, which is, you know, the U.S. armed forces in Europe, particularly by kind of forty four. I think he just does it so well. And actually, I think that kind of careful management, being mindful of men's lives, of not just recklessly sending people to be slaughtered. I buy that. And I, and I also buy the broad front strategy. I think you know, broad front strategy doesn't work if you're German because you can't possibly do it because you don't have enough. So you've got to do the whole Schwerpunkt thing. But 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 Americans are different. The Western allies are not like that. And And it's horses for courses. And he's absolutely the right man in the right post in the ETO, I think. So therefore, that means he's the right man at the end of the Tunisia campaign. And it also means he's the right man in, in, in Sicily as well, because that's all part of a, these are really important stepping stones on his transition, which in turn 
earlier stepping stones, such as being, you know, the, the, his time with the CCC is is also kind of formative and, and, and helps him become the man he is. I think your overall thesis, Al, is, is spot on. And I think it's why he's, I, I think he's rightly, or, or th- those who do kind of um, put him on that pedestal are right to do so. And I think those who don't, don't understand what they're talking about. Yeah, because Patton's such a big character, Bradley, who had a much bigger job than him, is sort of ed- is is edged out of the a picture. To come back to the the Patton movie, which is sort of where we began, but Bradley advises on that film. It's the most extraordinary thing, given their given their frenemy status. That 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 you know, I mean, maybe maybe that was Bradley's way of sort of finally finishing off what what he thought of Patton. It's like to consult it is on the, the film ultimate irony yeah he is he takes a major role in making sure that george Patton is immortalized forever yeah. forever yeah. exactly yeah. what Patton would have wanted yeah and <laughs> yet he also <laughs> affects our idea and image of Patton. i mean because many have pushed back on you know the movie has tons of things wrong in it of course and mm. and then some aspects of the interpretation been you know, certainly uh, opposed, but uh, so it's just so ironic that. But, but that also, Bradley, tell me a histor- tell me a historian or, or or a figure from history who's had any influence on a film. People people can have well, true. historical advisors, but <laughs> does anyone listen? Yeah, I mean, well, maybe they listen they, to him. I know. Well, they yeah, they paid him a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, and, and and said you're the advisor on the film. Okay, yeah, no problem. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll use your name, and and in his case. It, it works out because of the personal side, because his yeah. second wife was a, a screenwriter. And that's so right. yes. had that kind of influence beyond amazing. just who he was as a general. So that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. And it, and that whole story of the demise of his first wife uh, due to, due to uh, I think it was MS or I'm not sure, but a disease that she had. And and, uh, and then he's carrying on with, with Kitty, his second wife and all yeah. this. So, so Bradley has a very human side, too, that, that I don't think we generally know about. And she fiercely sort of defends his reputation, all that sort of stuff, doesn't she? And, and monetizes it all, and really, really gets stuck in in a in a, in a Hollywood way to sort of curating his legacy, which is very, very interesting. Yeah, big time. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, John. Um, uh, Tackled two giants there. That's two good. giants. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I, I, you know, when I came to writing the book, you have to talk about George Patton if this is the thing. The, this, you know, because after all, I'm trying to write a popular history book, and you want to. He's a great way of getting people in. In the in the gate, as it were, but he's such. They're both so. They're both so interesting, and they both offer you know the the, the polar opposites of of American martial culture, don't they? The sort of flash and dash, and then the doughboy. I mean, it's such an interesting contrast. Yeah. And the, the, guy the American really army can, with the nuts and bolts. Yeah. Well, exactly. But the American army can contain two vastly different styles like that at this time is also very interesting. Yeah, and the fact that they have impressive. This, this weird bond in some ways even as they're also adversaries too yeah that yeah. tells us it's something incredible. yeah well thanks very much john uh thanks james um thanks everybody for listening thanks, uh we'll be back with another we have ways usa soon cheerio